yeah, yeah, yeah. We back, man. Uh huh. So I realized since last time, most of y'all only know about Burr Rabbit through these Tar Baby stories. Highly problematic, okay? And we gotta address that. And I feel like I need to make a point on how popular these stories were among early African Americans. Take the case of Lydia Parrish, who spends three years on the plantation before being allowed to hear a single song. 10 years in and she was still only scratching the surface. That's how important these traditions were to us. As for the Tar Baby motif, we can find that around the world. But since we're talking about West Africans, we might wanna hone in on the story of Quaker Anansi and how he caught a fairy using the sticky sack from a tree. In the U.S., that sticky tree sap ends up becoming tar. And people have offered several reasons for this, but the most powerful and the most relevant center this tale on food rights and come from the great ancestor, Frederick Douglass. This garden was not the least source of trouble on the plantation. Its excellent fruit was quite a temptation to the hungry swarms of boys as well as the older slaves belonging to the colonel, few of whom had the virtue or the vice to resist it. Scarcely a day passed during the summer, but then some slave had to take the lash for stealing fruit. The colonel had to resort to all kinds of stratagems to keep his slaves out of the garden. The last and most successful one was that of tarring his fence all around, after which, if a slave was caught with any tar upon his person, it was deemed sufficient proof that he had either been into the garden or had tried to get in. In either case, he was severely whipped by the chief partner. This plan worked well. The slaves became as fearful of tar as of the lash. They seemed to realize the impossibility of touching the tar without being defiled. It was this motif that put Joel Chandler Harris, Uncle Remus, and Burr Rabbit on the dominant society's map, although President Theodore Roosevelt's brother was the first to publish. They had both come to learn these stories on a plantation from their aunt during their younger days. But Roosevelt is known for saying that presidents may come, presidents may go, but Uncle Remus stays put. <laughs> It can be hard to know how to take that. And personally, I'm still wrapping my mind around how Tar Baby ends up becoming America's favorite story. So by and by, he spied that Tar Baby. Then he sing out, how do you do? And Br'er Rabbit wait for the Tar Baby to say, fine, how are you? But the Tar Baby, he don't say nothing. And Br'er Fox, he lay low. So Br'er Rabbit tried again. How do you do? But the Tar Baby ain't saying nothing. Then Bear Rabbit scratch one ear with his off behind foot and loud, he will find out. Wait. Uh, what's the matter with you? I said howdy. Is you hard in here? I said howdy. But the tar baby, he don't say nothing. Now it's up to him to teach the stuck up stranger some manners. And he said, Look, if you don't say howdy time I count three, I'm gonna bust you wide open. But the tar baby, he don't say nothing. Tar Baby can reference just a sticky situation. In North America, those connotations are quite clear. Okay, so next is my man Ralph Bakshi, who puts his own spin on the Tar Baby motif. In the 1975 classic book band film, Coonskin, featuring Barry White and Scott McCall. Oklahoma City, a weighing in at 210 pounds. Oh. <laughs> See you on. Oh, 
we are in a lot of trouble. Hey! Did he sing out? Hi there! How do you do? What's the matter with you? You're not hard of hearing. But the tall baby, he don't say nothing. What you waiting for? Hello, hello. Yeah, this fight is over. Hello. Hello. Oh, hello. 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 Hello especially if we only look at it from a Western perspective. What is the true value of greetings in human society? And why are greetings so important to African Americans? Is this something that we might have overlooked? There's long been an unwritten law among black people that we acknowledge one another in nearly all circumstances. But in order to get to the root of this mysterious tradition, we may have to take a journey back through time and space. You might be thinking, African tribes have been described as anything but peaceful and harmonious. But uh, that's not a position that is tenable with actual history. Great Emperor of Mali, Sujata Keita, organized the Kurugan Fuga, and with that, ultimately united ethnic groups which span all the way from Senegal to Cameroon. These institutions are still partially existent today. Despite the forces of history, African Americans remain a unique inheritor of this royal legacy. For strength and solidarity in their commitment to protecting one another. In my whole tour in Vietnam, you know, when you met a black soldier, you know, he had a gap and a special handshake. You can even, you got to call you can tell what part of the, of the country he was from, because everybody had their distinctive gap or handshake. You definitely could tell if he wasn't in your company, because everybody, you know, everybody had their little nuance. Since the end of the Vietnam War, the DAP has broadened and become a part of mainstream American culture. However, we must never forget its original meaning of unity and taking care of one another. I'm not above you, you're not above me, we're side by side together. And that's the original DAP. That was Lamont Hamilton, an interdisciplinary artist who created the Five on the Black Hand Side Project. Indeed, we can trace much of these just drill traditions straight back to West African kingdoms and empires. And like many of our Black American traditions, they stretch all the way deep back into antiquity. And the crazy part is, they're still driving culture today, even on a global scale. And the origin of the DAC, in particular, plays a major role in concretizing its place in American history. That marks a physical aspect to these greetings. But there's a second part, a verbal aspect. Let's hear it from an expert, though. Dig this. Some MCs get their notoriety through battling, meaning that back in the days, we used to call it the dozens. Slaves were sold one by one unless there was a defect. Their leg was hurt, her arm was uh, severed, mental issues, maybe sick. Those people were sold um, in a dozen. So slaves would start going back and forth with each other saying, uh, well, your head's bigger than your neck and that makes you a lollipop. Ah, your mother is so this, I could do that. Ah, and everybody would laugh at you, which then eventually became the dozens. So the idea of battling coming out of this tradition called the dozens, where you verbally attack your opponent and your opponent verbally attacks you until somebody breaks down and either wants to fight, cries, whatever it is, or, or a judge deems the battle won by either opponent. This trickles over into rapping. It was Zulu Nation that first brought up the idea of we don't have to shoot at each other or beat on each other or, or this. We can actually use this tradition of the dozens to actually have verbal warfare. Verbal warfare indeed, but at the crux of it, the essence of the dozens and of joking relationships in West Africa are more about developing the sophistication, the intelligence, and the wit to be able to not take offense and not resort to violence. This tradition is so well spread in the black world 
that one can only amaze at its variety, knowing that it may have only one singular recent origin. We also find ancient precursors to this tradition. We're in the ancient Nile Valley who had the 42 laws of Ma'at and the 42 gnomes of ancient Kemet. In West Africa, in the Mali Empire, there was a similar situation. The Kuru Kanfu Kachare with 44 articles. Thanks to that, those were agreement. And then they tried to organize the society with them. And that helped him uh, to be a real um, a king. This article 7 of the Kuru Kanfu Kachare um, uh, brought the Sanahuya, that is the brotherhood, uh, the joking relationship. And then the, the, there were different, for instance, the grandfather and the grandson, those are joking cousins. Uh, different uh, last names are joking cousins, like Jara and Traoré, that is in Mali. You go in Senegal, you will find Job, which will be the same thing like uh, the joking cousin, and then of Jara. And then we have those same last names, where in the society, when you were the joking cousin, you were not supposed to fight, having blood, no bloodshed. And then that was something uh, that the society, the people knew in the community. Like even today in Africa, in West Africa, most of the country in Mali, for instance, I'm Jara, if my joking cousin is Traoré, uh, I will never, never ever intentionally kill him because i know that according to my ancestor that was um, f that was forbidden we cannot even uh, we will not even fight whenever he does something which is not good i would tell truth to him but i would never take him like an enemy if you do that your personality if you it will be you will you will feel it in your life uh, it will be a curse for you and that is why the people in that time believe those kind of organization with all this said i feel like historical rivals like martin and malcolm could have benefited greatly from strong institutions that reflected these traditions. Anyway, there's only so much that can be said in one short take. I hope this video gives you at least something to think about as you go out and compete in the world amongst your peers. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and stay tuned for the next one. We out.